When we talk about the Apollo landings, we talk about Neil Armstrong taking manual control. We talk about computer alarms. We talk about low fuel. But there's a system almost no one remembers. And yet it worked quietly beneath every lunar module that ever descended toward the moon. A small flat radar panel mounted on the underside of the descent stage. No lights, no sound, no drama. But without it, every crew would have been descending blind. This is the story of the Lunar Module Landing Radar, the first solid-state radar flown in human spaceflight, and the sensor that gave the astronauts the truth they needed when the surface of the moon rushed upward faster than any pilot could judge with the naked eye. The lunar module needed three things during powered descent. How far it was from the surface, how fast it was falling, and how quickly it was drifting across the lunar terrain. Without those measurements, the guidance computer could not steer the spacecraft, and the astronauts could not fly it manually. During the early design phase, NASA understood a simple but brutal fact. No human being can visually judge altitude and horizontal drift with the precision needed for a safe landing. The moon gives you no depth cues. You can be 40 meters above the surface and think you are only 10. You can be sliding sideways at several meters per second and not notice until it's too late. The landing radar was the only instrument that could measure slant range vertical velocity and horizontal velocity directly from the surface return. Real physics, real numbers, not estimates. Every Apollo landing depended on those numbers. The landing radar consisted of two major units, the antenna assembly mounted outside on the descent stage and the electronics assembly mounted inside the lunar module. The antenna assembly is where the magic began. NASA used interlaced planar phased arrays, four rectangular arrays sitting nearly flush with the skin of the spacecraft. Three of the beams were for velocity, one was for altitude. Each beam had to maintain a razor-thin shape even when temperatures swung from minus 240 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 240 degrees Fahrenheit, the external thermal range the unit had to survive. Inside the spacecraft sat the electronics assembly, a dense, compact stack of frequency trackers, converters, mixers, modulators, and digital conversion circuits. This assembly took the microwave returns, stripped them down into Doppler frequencies, tracked them with narrow band filters, and sent the results as serial binary data straight into the lunar module guidance computer. Both assemblies had to survive vibration, shock, vacuum, and a harsh thermal environment. No part of this subsystem was allowed to drift, deform, or misalign. It was the definition of precision engineering. Velocity measurement was handled by three continuous wave Doppler beams transmitted at 10.51 gigahertz. Each beam was angled slightly outward and downward. The outgoing microwave energy hit the lunar surface bounced back and carried a frequency change, the Doppler shift, proportional to the spacecraft's motion along that beam. The return entered balanced crystal mixers, where the radar compared the received signal with a portion of the transmitted one. This produced an audio frequency tone, whose frequency matched the Doppler shift exactly. That tone was fed to frequency trackers, 
narrow, agile filters that locked onto the shift, followed its movement, and produced an averaged output with remarkable precision. By combining the three beams' velocity components, the electronics assembly computed forward motion, sideways drift, and vertical speed. This meant the guidance computer always knew whether the lunar module was sliding across the surface or dropping too fast, information that the astronauts absolutely depended on during the final landing phase. Altitude sensing used a different technique called Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave. The altimeter beam transmitted at 9.58 GHz using a sawtooth modulation waveform sweeping at 130 Hz. As the frequency swept upward and reset, a rising and falling pattern was transmitted toward the moon. When this signal reflected and returned, the radar compared the instant frequency of the outgoing wave to the instantaneous frequency of the incoming wave. The difference revealed the round-trip travel time and therefore the slant range to the surface. To keep the measurement clean, the electronics removed the Doppler contribution so horizontal motion would not pollute the altitude reading. This system was so accurate that during the Apollo 11 descent, the altimeter beam locked onto the surface at the expected altitude and tracked through the entire landing phase with almost no deviation from the predicted reflectivity models. If you look at the diagrams in the Apollo technical note, you see a beautiful arrangement of beams. Three beams splayed outward for velocity. One beam directed downward for altitude. All four beams were tightly shaped by the phased array. This allowed NASA to maintain narrow, high-gain beams in a system only a few inches thick, something that would have been impossible with a parabolic dish. The array also weighed less. NASA compared both designs on paper. The parabolic dish would have been heavier, deeper, and more sensitive to mechanical distortion. The array offered better gain and a reduced depth of just three inches. That alone saved nearly a kilogram. But the choice came with an unexpected challenge. The interlaced altimeter array slightly pulled the Doppler beams off their predicted pointing angles. Engineers had to redesign the tuning elements to bring the beams back into precise alignment. This was typical Apollo engineering. Solve one problem, reveal another, refine, test, refine again. Before it ever flew, the landing radar went through aircraft flight tests at White Sands Missile Range. Aircraft traced simulated descent trajectories giving engineers real return data under dynamic conditions. The radar was also tested through thermal extremes, vibration, shock, and vacuum, anything it might encounter from Earth to the Moon. In 1968, NASA conducted the PEARL tests, the performance evaluation of Apollo rendezvous and landing radar, because earlier data had timing errors. Pearl confirmed that the landing radar behaved exactly as expected during steep, shallow, and intermediate descent profiles. NASA also needed to understand lunar reflectivity. Nobody knew how strongly the moon would reflect microwave energy, so engineers performed reflectivity tests over deserts, volcanic terrain, and sandy plains to measure how the radar behaved at different incidence angles. These data were then extrapolated into a lunar model. By the time the radar flew, NASA had confidence that it would lock on to the lunar surface at the right altitude with return strength within predicted limits. During testing, 
The radar detected low-frequency Doppler signals from vibrating structures inside the lunar module itself. The radar literally saw the spacecraft shaking and thought the moon was moving. Engineers installed metal shielding, rotated the antenna by six degrees, and reduced the low-frequency gain of the preamplifiers to prevent false lock-ons. Another issue appeared during Apollo 9. The aluminized mylar blanket beneath the descent stage began flaking during engine firings. Those flakes reflected radar energy and created false Doppler signals. NASA replaced the mylar with ablative paint on future missions, a fix born entirely from the space environment, something that no Earth test had revealed. There were also timing issues caused by long cables, a logic race condition that created one-count velocity errors and even arcing inside the radar's high-voltage transmitter sections during vacuum testing. Each issue was corrected with redesigned circuits, shortened wiring runs, or improved spacing between components. This was the Apollo pattern. Find problems early, fix them aggressively, and test again until the system could survive anything. During Apollo 9, the radar operated normally, except for the Mylar issue. It provided clean Doppler and range data as long as flakes were not interfering. Apollo 10 provided reflectivity data that improved the lunar models. During Apollo 11, the radar performed almost perfectly during the descent to the Sea of Tranquility. The radar locked on to the lunar surface at the correct altitude, and its measured reflectivity closely matched NASA's Earth-based predictions. Only a couple of near-zero velocity points appeared questionable, likely due to the guidance computer overload alarms rather than the radar itself. Apollo 12 showed even better performance. The radar locked on early and strong returns suggested high reflectivity, possibly due to local terrain slopes at the landing site. By the end of Apollo 12, NASA considered the landing radar one of the most reliable systems on the spacecraft. The landing radar provided truth. Not guesses, not approximations. Truth. As the lunar module approached the surface, the radar told the guidance computer exactly how fast the spacecraft was descending and how far it had left to go. This allowed the computer to calculate throttle commands and allowed the astronauts to judge when to take manual control. Even when Armstrong took over during Apollo 11, the radar continued feeding altitude and velocity data into the cockpit and into the guidance computer's state vector. Armstrong depended on those numbers when he pitched forward, surveyed the boulder field, and guided the spacecraft toward a safe landing spot. Without the radar, astronauts would have had no reference for drift, sink rate, or height above the surface. Human vision simply cannot provide the needed accuracy. This radar was one of the smallest units on the lunar module, just 42 pounds of electronics and phased arrays, but it delivered information that made the difference between a safe landing and a fatal impact. It was, quite literally, the sensor that saved every descent. NASA recommended that future systems use digital filtering to avoid analog drift issues, explore subsystem limits beyond normal mission profiles, and ensure all ground equipment and interface documents stay updated with the flight hardware configuration. These lessons came directly from the intense development of the landing radar. The Lunar Module Landing Radar proved that when you combine rigorous testing, solid engineering, and relentless problem solving, 
you can build a radar system that works flawlessly on another world. The landing radar never spoke. It never produced an alarm. It never needed attention unless it failed, and it never did. It simply pointed its beams at the surface of the moon, tracked the motion of the lunar module, and delivered the truth during the most dangerous moments of every mission. While astronauts navigated thrust, dust, and unknown terrain, the landing radar remained calm, precise, honest. It is one of the least known heroes of Project Apollo, a sensor that, hidden beneath the spacecraft, quietly watched over every descent and helped humanity land on another world.